He used to deliver babies. Running a mile with 
done two laps. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> Our campaign has something to do with a revolution. It has to do with an idea whose time has come, and nobody can stop an idea whose time has come. <laughs> 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 I put up liberty and behind the bell and made America great, but for some reason or another, a hundred years ago, they sort of forgot about it. But it's been revived by a new generation who cares about the cause of liberty and peace. <laughs> Uh, a lot of debt we're inheriting, a lot less freedom than the previous generation had, and also they end up graduating from college and having trouble getting jobs, and they wonder why. Well, there's a reason for it, believe me. It has to do with the economic and the political system that has been corrupted and has to be changed. <laughs> running for uh, president four years ago now, I said, the difference is night and day, because people recognize that the financial crisis which was on our doorstep four years ago is here, and it's serious, and it's big. At the same time, it's been many years that I have been trying desperately to stay out of wars. I'm trying to get out of I get the wars. <laughs> Over 70% of the American people said, time to come home, time to get out of Afghanistan. It has no purpose for us. <laughs> 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 then when you think about uh, the, the, the spending, you can't uh, not think about how much we spend overseas. It's approximately $4 trillion worth of debt that has been in that because of the foreign adventurism of the last 10 years. So even if those individuals out there that still believe that we have to be over there, the other hand that have to take criticize the law if you're not doing enough, they want to do more. <laughs> what are we going to do with that? Where are they going to get the money? Where are they going to get the money? Or government? Or so it, it's coming to an end. All great empires are in for financial reasons. We don't have to worry about being attacked militarily. We are strong and we can take care of ourselves. But I'll tell you what, we're not taking care of ourselves at home very well. And that is what we have to do. <laughs> against all enemies. Foreign, and we handle that pretty well. But we're supposed to look at the domestic enemies as well, and that's where our real threat is. We have a government now essentially out of control. Uh, we have, for a long time, our presidents have used executive orders to pass laws. Just recently, the president said, well, Congress is acting too slowly. I want this regulation passed. I'll just write an executive order. Well, that's the only if you have a constitutional president and you look at all the illegal executive orders, you can repeal all of them by an executive order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got into our crisis four years ago and the consequence of spending too much and borrowing too much and regulating too much and printing too much. And guess what they've been doing for four years? They have been spending more, taxing more, regulating more, and printing more. And they think they're going to get out of trouble that way. And guess what? We still have our recession going on. We still have our problems. And the deficit is exploding. Our country now is the greatest debtor in the history of the world. We owe more money to foreigners than any country has ever had. And yet, we're supposed to be bailing out the world. Even today, as we speak, our government and our Federal Reserve are laying plans to bail out Europe by Greek debt. It's vanishing. <laughs> it's impossible. It won't work. Yet they're still embarking on that. I think the main problem that we got into is a long time ago, uh, 
our, our country and, and the people in charge lost an interest in what liberty was all about. They were very interested in the fruits of liberty because the fruits of liberty, when you have a free society and, and, and uh, sound money, you have a lot of prosperity. But they concentrated on the prosperity, which is wonderful, but they forgot about where the prosperity came from. They thought it came from the government. They thought if you had a good lobbyist and you could redistribute wealth, you could benefit. And the tragedy is they did for a long time. But now the treasury is bare and there's a lot of a problem and we have to get back to producing wealth if we expect to be a wealthy nation. <laughs> When, when we had wealth, it wasn't so bad, they could talk about compromise. We'll compromise this, uh, somebody wants a weapon system, we'll pay for that, somebody else wants some other social program, we'll compromise and do that until you run out of money. And then all of a sudden, what happens? The lobbyists and the special interests become more aggressive and more aggressive, but what do they have to go after? It's a shrinking pie. The pie is just about gone, and that is why there's a conflict in Washington, why you're not going to see this resolved. Just think of last summer when they were trying to resolve this budgetary problem. They were going to get together, and they couldn't resolve it, so they said, we're going to create a super committee. And they're going to do it. And they made a super mess out of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure did. But just now, you know, we know that the current administration wants to spend even more money. But uh, the Republican alternative is, has been proposed and uh, slightly better. The deficits don't expand quite as rapidly, but they're talking about way out here. So they have proposed automatic increases. All they ever talk about are cuts and the proposed increases. They're not talking about real cuts. I'd like to make the point that what we need to do in the very first year, we should cut the budget by one trillion dollars. <laughs> No, the only problem is, is we don't have compromise. Well, the compromise worked fine when there was a lot of money and they compromised on spending. But they're not going to compromise, they're just going to fight more. And it isn't so much that the two parties have different philosophies, but they have different special interests and they have different desires to hold power. So the whole effort is to have power and pay off the lobbyists who have the best, have the most interest, but there's not going to be a solution. What we need today is a coalition of people who believe in liberty for various reasons. We need to bring people together. This is the reason I talk about this a lot because there are so many who understand freedom from an economic viewpoint that we should have a free market and sound money. But they don't understand that freedom means the individual has freedom too for social reasons as well. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, if we followed the founders' advice and minded our own business and not told other countries how to live, maybe we would have more friends around the world rather than. <laughs> <laughs> constantly that all we need, and I've been, been pressed for this all the time, how are you going to compromise you have such firm beliefs? Now I said, what are we going to do? When the president announces that he's going to assassinate American citizens, how are we going to compromise on that? Just assassinate a few at a time? Boo. Boo. There is no compromise. Presidents have no authority to direct an assassination of American citizens. Where is it? Where is it? Reserve system. Yeah. Uh, 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 
you have a constitution which says only gold and silver can be legal tender, or you allow men in secret, men and women in secret, print the amount of money that they want to bail out their friends and bail out the world to the tune of trillions of dollars, and they won't even reveal what they've done. I would say there's no compromise on that. Paper money doesn't work. It's always mailed. It generates the funds to fight the wars and to run up the deficits at home and, and compete the, and, and continue the welfare state and bail out all the special interests. So I would say that's not where you want to compromise. You, you need to bring people together. The cause of liberty will bring people together. And there's no reason why we can't keep this message going because the reception is growing by leaps and bounds by the people who are interested in this message. <laughs> Majorities are never what lose the country. People who are determined and have the least strong beliefs and ideas in the world, ideas do have consequences. But you need a small group of people that are our race and tireless and will work and spread the fresh fires of liberty in the minds of men. That is what we need today, and that is what's happening. <laughs> Since 9-11, I, I think uh, in many ways we've gone backwards as far as protection of civil liberties. Our civil liberties are under threat. Ultimately, that should be the case. You have economic liberty, you want prosperity, certainly. And you have foreign policy and monetary policy. But everything can boil down is what is your concept of liberty? Where does liberty come from? For me, it comes in a natural way. It comes in a God-given way. It comes as a gift. It doesn't come from our government. If you're going to have a government, the government should be there for the purpose of protecting liberty, not undermining liberty. <laughs> but there was a total misunderstanding of exactly how 9-11 occurred and, what, and why it occurred. And that we were told that the reason it happened was that the people that came here, they hated us because we were free and prosperous. That is not true. They came here for other reasons. And the tragedy is, the tragedy is, is that uh, it was used as an excuse to do a lot of things they had wanted to do all along. Mm -hmm. For instance, there has been, for, for over a decade, they had been looking for a, an opportunity to invade and overthrow our former allies, Saddam Hussein, in, in Iraq. So we were told that Al-Qaeda was in Iraq and they had nuclear weapons and they were about to attack us. On and on, oh, up, up online, oh, and the American yeah. people pumped up with that war propaganda. It turned out to be not true. It's a mess. It was a mess over there. We lost a lot of lives, spent many, many hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's ongoing. It's not over there yet. And uh, this is the reason that we have to take a position to understand. Just think of all the problems we've had since World War II with the excess of war and the absence of peace mainly because they have done one thing. We have had men and women and presidents in Congress about who have not followed the rule of law, and the rule of law says you can't go to war without a declaration of war. <laughs> television was being interviewed uh, and uh, he was he was asked about uh, you know where he got the authority and come to Congress for the authority to go into Libya and, and uh, the proposal to go into Syria which they actually are already there he said well he got his he he'll, he'll, he'll get it from an international body he'll get it from the United Nations or NATO <laughs> And it is because of our careless regard for the rule of law that has led us to, into so many of these things, whether it's the economic problems we have, the monetary policy, the welfare state, or the international crisis that we have. But it's coming to an end. It's going to come to an end for financial reasons. It's going to give us an opportunity, just that they saw it an opportunity to see a crisis come, to expand the role of government. We're going to see this as an opportunity to shrink the size of government. Yeah. <laughs> Year, a lot of new laws came into existence, just a small number, uh, 40,000 new York laws on January 1st. Put that in our problem that we don't have enough laws. I would like to be the first president to get rid of 40,000. <laughs> I think that's 
this whole time. Right. The same here we have the income tax. Major changes occurred in, during the Wilson administration, the progressive era. The monetary policy changed, the tax policy changed, and also the foreign policy changed. It was Wilson who said, let's make the world safe for democracy. It was all this, you know, idealism. Always wonderful things. We're going to do this for idealistic reason. Uh, this is a, a lot, there's a writer now that uh, has coined the word uh, neo Jacobinism. And it is, in many ways, this is what we're doing around the world. It's always in the best interest. I've I reduced all this stuff to uh, intervention. I want to uh, have a government that's non interventions non interventions overseas, non interventions in your personal life, and non interventions in our economic lives as well. <laughs> We understand the whole concept of liberty. This means that people would come, would should come together because everybody's going to use their liberty differently. Everybody has different social values. Everybody has different religious values. And the books you read are going to be different. And we should recognize that. And to a degree, we do. But then we limit it. And some people say, well, if we give them too much freedom, they're going to have some bad habits. And, and they're not going to be good, which may be true. But do you want the government to make those decisions? Or you want to In a way, other people think, well, if we give them too much economic liberty, they're going to waste their money, they're going to do these things, they won't take care of themselves. But i tell you what, if you, bring, if, you, if you understand this whole issue, we should be able to bring people together. And this is why so often we see diversity in it. It's not because we agree on how we should run our lives, but we agree that we should have the right to run our lives and spend our lives. <laughs> The crisis that we're facing today is of great magnitude, and uh, the big question is, will we turn it around? I, I think, yes, we will. It's not going to be easy. If we did the right thing, it wouldn't be all that bad. Because so often they tell you, people come up and say, I have a solution for you. We did this. Now, what we have to do is this, this, and this. You have to sacrifice. Now, if I come to you and say that I can't, you know, implement these laws tomorrow, have sound money, free markets, property rights, contract rights, and uh, no more wars overseas, protecting your personal liberty, and that you keep what you earn, what kind of sacrifice would that be? I would say that you should welcome that. <laughs> Now, liberty should not be a sacrifice. There can't be an adjustment period. But when the government gets involved in the natural requirements of adjustment, when the Federal Reserve, the government gets things so out of whack, there has to be a correction. Corrections are good. But when you prolong the, the corrections and deny the correction, you prolong the agony, as we did in our depression, as Japan has been doing and as we're doing right now. We're prolonging the agony because we don't allow the correction to occur. You know, uh, the entire Government system has been, you know, something that's been well known. That we have to take care of people. You know, help the people who are poor. They need free education, free medical care, and free houses. And we have to take care of them. And the government's supposed to give them this free stuff. And what the other day when they asked me that on TV, I said, wait, wait a minute. Where does the government get it? They don't have anything for free. They have to take it from somebody. You know, that, that isn't for free. So if, if, we, uh, if we endorse the entitlement system, it sounds good. So let's look at the housing program. It was meant to make sure poor people had houses. So it seemed to work for a while. More and more people had houses. It, uh, the credit was just created out of thin air, made easy credit. The interest rates were low. And then they had affirmative action type programs where they told the banks, you have to make loans here. You have to do this. You have to make risky loans. So they went and did this. And more people had houses. The price of houses went up. They borrowed against the equity increase. The house. It looked like a, 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 a perfect money machine. Yeah, until the bubble burst, which was predictable. But guess, guess what happened after the bubble burst? The people who had been making the billions who branched off into derivatives, the banks and the Fannie Mae's and the Freddie Mac's and, and all those people who were making billions and billions of dollars, they streamed at hard. There's going to be a depression. There's going to be a depression. You've got to fill us up. We're too big to fail. So the politicians rush, yeah, we've got to bail them out. We've got to bail them out. And, and guess what happened? They got bailed out. So the entitlement went to the realm wealthy who had already been making money. And what happened to the people who had in the middle class? Middle class people lost their jobs and they lost their houses. 
So it doesn't work. And this is what we have to accept. This is work. <laughs> Sometimes I think what we need is a lot more confidence in our, in our beliefs, in our conviction, that it actually works. And it does. And we have way too much confidence that if we go to the government, they're going to take care of it. Now, that works to a degree.